families together, keep our relationships together. And now it's time for God to just replenish us. You know, we try to do too much, too fast. So Father, we ask that you fill our minds with your spirit. We invite you into this room. Our behaviors, our attitude, Lord. We ask you to just be the leader of our lives. 
You can change me. I believe, I believe. You are who you say you are. I believe, I believe. You can change.
Praise God. Is God good or what? Yes. <laughs> Say all the time. All the time. All the time. God, is good. God is good. Today we're going to talk about to have no other gods. Oh, Say, don't you to have no other gods? Yeah. All the time. We're going to start the new series, the, the foundation for a strong family, folks. We're going to start looking at moving forward to understand what God intended when He gave us the Ten Commandments. How many of you know your Ten Commandments? Come on, raise your hand. Nobody knows more? But we're going to focus today on the First Commandment. I was asking one of the kids here today if they knew the Ten Commandments. You know, but today I want to be able to share with you that uh, as we focus on have no other gods. When God says that in the scripture, have no other gods, what did he mean? Not rhetorical, what did he mean? He put anything else before it. Exodus 20, verse 3. Put it in your Bibles, look it up right now, because at this point, you know, this is important. I'm going to give you the Old Testament version of the first commandment. And then you have the New Testament version of the Ten Commandments. Alright? Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 gives you the original version. The Old Testament. Which says what? Shall not. Say it. Shall not. You shall not have no for me. Now the new version, the text of New Testament, Jesus says in Matthews chapter 4, verse 10. That's the one most people are more familiar with. It says what? Love the Lord your God and serve him only. With all your what? Heart, soul, strength. Heart, mind, soul. However you choose to put it, it's all the same. But in Exodus 24, it tells you, you shall not make yourself an idol. Now, we talk about why did God bring the Ten Commandments in in the first place? You know, when I was growing up, I didn't have, I didn't have any religion, no faith, none of those things. But I did have one thing God provided me with. The Ten Commandments. He gave me Charleston Heston, right? That's what he gave me in the Ten Commandments. Every year, the Ten Commandments, the movie, the Hollywood version was on TV. That's how I learned the Ten Commandments. So God found a way to bring his law to me. And so often we, we miss out on why God gave us the Ten Commandments in the first place. Anybody can tell me why God gave you the Ten Commandments in the first place? I could uh, give me one minute. I want to see these little guys know first. Can you tell me why? Okay. Listen carefully. You need to know why God gave us the Ten Commandments. And what is the Ten Commandments anyway? Can you tell me what that is? Ah, listen carefully. You need to master this. Yes, go ahead, brother. Tell me why. Why did he give us the Ten Commandments? We're going to guess. Um, there were always in society uh, forms of worship. And they were always created after what God created. And man always found a way to try to deify something, to worship something that was greater than him. Because within us, we find that there's always something that is greater than us. And so because God saw that we were worshiping out of idols, dead idols, he didn't want them to compare or confuse him with these things that were certain that were lifeless. And he just wanted to establish with them that there is a God, that's, that's me. And there's only one God, that's me. Okay. Very good point. Everybody heard that? Yes. Is it clear? All right. Because it was necessary. Very good, man. Thank you very much. The, the Ten Commandments are necessary for God's new nation. Now he says new nation because the old nation, the people that fell into slavery in Egypt, were living a life of depravity. Now, this is the 
concept was that because the Israelites were in, how many know how many years were the Israelites enslaved by Egypt? 500, 400, 500, 400, 800, 800. give me the right number. Six hundred thirty. Somebody should go on the line, right? Right? Ah, oh, those are the hundreds of years, right? Let me, I'll let you figure that out. Yes, because you need to find out. I have to give you something to look for. You know, if I give you everything, you're gonna want it, you know, then that's the problem with our society. We want everything. Monotheism. What is that? Monotheism. M-O-N. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M. What does it mean? It's the belief in only one God. But the problem was that in Egypt, they had many gods and many idols. That's what they worshiped. And for the 700 years that they were a slave in Egypt, they worshiped many gods. And the more gods you had meant what? If you had more than one god, what was the concept? truly understand him and understand his purpose for us as well as the beauty of the law. The law, the Ten Commandments were meant to be beautiful, effective, wonderful, good, yeah. a blessing. It was meant to produce all the good things in life. Amen. So he gave you something, the Ten Commandments. But people saw the Ten Commandments now because it was a problem. When you're used to having many gods and all Yes, because they made a lot of money of having a lot of gods. But the purpose to lead them, he wanted the, the Ten Commandments for the, so they could understand the purpose of understanding that he was the only one God. But he wanted to lead them into a life uh, of practical holiness. He wanted to say, I created you to be holy. I created you to be good. I created you to produce good fruit. But you could only get that if you understand the concept of having one God, the only God. The God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the creator of all the earth. That's the one God. So when he says, shall not have any other God before me, he was throwing them, giving them something they weren't used to, a concept. See, the law were, were designed to direct the community to meet the needs of each individual. So in a community, every individual, this need, every individual's need was going to be met by the Ten Commandments. But the first commandment covered all the other commandments. I want you to keep that in mind. The first commandment which if we look at it in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and however you want to put it, there is in that one. You comply with that one, and you fulfill all the others. So he wanted to sort of show us what he had for us. He wanted us to understand the concept. He said, never lose sight of the fact that the world judges you at this point because of you serving just one God. And we're gonna have gonna be challenged. But the point, point of this sermon today is to develop the strong family. We cannot develop a strong family without this number one concept. Now, because uh, they have so many other gods we've gotten so used to, see, uh, and, and God says, now I need you to be responsible. Remember, we gotta break habits. 
By Jesus' time, most of the people, by Jesus' time, at the time Jesus came along, most people looked at the law the wrong way. They saw it as more as a means, a means to three things, prosperity. So they looked at the laws for prosperity. They looked at it as for protection. And they looked at it as to keep the law, law keeping. Those are the three principles. Prosperity, both in the world here today and the one to come. So they look at prosperity that way. Okay, and the, and the commandments weren't so much only for that, but this is how they saw it. You see, protection, they, were, they looked at it as a way that they obey the ways of God. How many of you always think about, if I follow God's way, good things are going to happen? How many of you always say when things bad happen, you always in your mind, a little in your mind says, I must be doing something wrong? Right? Because the enemy tries to instill this kind of concept in you. And we have to break ourselves out of this momentum or this mentality. We have to understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Once He blessed, you are blessed. Amen. But we are waiting to do all the right things. But He said, so they were looking at it, right? If I do all the right things, if I go to church, if I do all that, God will protect me. And then again, the law keeping, it became, it became an end. An end in itself. You see, they weren't even looking about, and not the means to fulfill God's uh, ultimate law of love. Because he says if we follow God's law of love, it fulfills everything. Amen. But we start to put it in areas that are dysfunctional and unhealthy. Exodus, go through the Bible, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. And he's going to tell you as you start reading, you have many gods, many idols. See, and these gods represented, represented a different aspect of life. Okay, gods. Anything could be your god. Anything. So often we don't even realize it. You know what? I'm going to be honest with you today. I, I came to the danger, I mean really dangerous place of making Netflix my god. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Because Netflix, at this point, I can watch Netflix when I was in uh, waiting on line, waiting for the train. You know, I was watching Netflix when I was, uh, even in traffic, I was watching Netflix. <laughs> now I was watching Netflix everywhere, all the time. As soon as I had time to waste, like that I felt that I had available, I was watching Netflix. Absolutely. Right? Entertainment. But remember, TV and all that stuff is a God because it's teaching you the morality of our times. It is coming into you one way or the other. You see? But what good is it giving you? It's giving you what other three? Today, back in Egypt, there were many gods. You can't tell you how many gods and the animals and the idols they had. In the New Testament, there were three main gods, which I'm going to talk about next week. But I want to give you the three main gods were what? The god of sex was called what? The arrows. Starts with a B. Yes. All right. The sex of the god of money was. That's with an M. The god of violence was. With an M also. I'm not going to tell you because I want you to look at it before I tell you next week. <laughs> These are the gods we serve today. Because TV has those gods right now. They have sex, violence, and money greed. When will you watch any program to me that I find it? See, they are gods we serve and you're not even aware of it. And we are in danger of that. That's why serving the only one God has become complicated and difficult for us. Because we are already serving many gods. You say, oh, I don't serve any God. You know, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to be very thorough about how you find yourself falling into that and how can you truly not have no other gods. 
Because sometimes whatever you put so much interest and focus on, whatever becomes a priority, that's why in the scripture when the Bible talks about don't put your husband or wife or husband, father or child before God. He tells you specifically those things, but we do it all the time. They become the priority. And you know what? When it comes down to it, the only one that can save you is God. The one true God. A good quality of life is finding a good balance between all the things we do in life. But God has to be the priority. And he says, when he gave us the first commandment, he wanted to make sure we understand that we got to understand the concept of not worshiping all these other gods. Because we put so much focus and interest and all our time into that. And he said, I need you to start looking at it the way God wants you to see it. God represents, a, uh, he says, God, the gods of those times re uh, represented a difficult aspect of life, a different aspect of life. It was common to worship many gods in order to get uh, a maximum, the maximum number of blessings. That's the way they saw it. When, when, the, when it was said there were only one God, this was difficult for the, 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 to accept. No other God before me. He said, no other God before me. I'm going to be reading scripture to tell you that. I can go to so many scriptures that tells you to have no other God before me. I'm going to read the scripture in Deuteronomy. And it tells you, it makes it very clear that I can give you testament, uh, scripture from the New Testament to confirm what Jesus said. So there's scriptures here that confirm everything that I'm about to tell you. If they didn't learn, and this is based on you know, when they came out of Egypt, and this was what God gave them the Ten Commandments because he was saying you, you've been so used to worship so many God and now I need you to understand your true purpose. So I want you to understand your true purpose. But if they didn't learn why God led them out of Egypt, the only true God, they couldn't be his people. I want to make that very clear. If they couldn't learn that he delivered them from Egypt, Letting them know that I am the only God that you have to can deliver, and he proved it through the, what were the miracles that you know today that he committed back then? What was the miracles? Give me one miracle that said, man, I don't know. The parting of the Red Sea. When the worst time of their life, when they knew their life was over, and there was no other way, God made a way. I told you weeks ago, Choose three things in your list of what God has done to you to part that Red Sea in your life. Because you're going to need to hold on to that. As we move forward especially. Because things may look like it's the end of the world for you. And God's just using that to part the Red Sea. Turn to someone. Are you ready? Or you're going to panic. So he said, you couldn't be my people if you can't understand why I delivered you out of Egypt and why I'm telling you I'm the only God. He said, no matter how faithfully they kept the other nine commandments, doesn't matter. You can fulfill all the nine commandments, but if you fail to do the number one, none of the other nine is going to matter. Turn to someone and find out they understand that. See, God wasn't asking them to add one more God. That would have been easy for them to do. Because if you're used to doing all of this, and now I'm just going to do this, you know, I can do all the bad habits, but now I'm going to go to church. But if you continue doing all the bad habits, is it going to matter that you come to church? Think about this. Because so often we can say a lot of things that I'm going to do, or I believe this, but I'm not doing anything about it, and we deceive ourselves. It's like trying to change dysfunctional behavior, see, by adding something else. You've got to deal with the dysfunction. You've got to get it out. Because if you don't deal with it, and I know it's difficult to accept the concept, but you will not be delivered if you don't do anything about it. When the Bible says we get saved, we become a new creation. 
Right? What does it mean to be a new creation? When God says you are new now, he was referring to that new concept, the new nation. And understanding that commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Give him everything. Make him everything. And we're going to talk about how to do that in a minute. Now, I want you to keep in mind, no marriage or family would ever reach its full potential unless everyone in, in it works together. Unity, purpose, respecting one another, relying on each other and, and each other's strength and weaknesses. Because right now, this will expose all, all the things that, we are, that has been dysfunctional in our lives. We need to understand that God had a purpose for everything. Turn your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Tell me what you read. So I want to make sure this is clear. I'm going to put this there nonstop so you can hear it. He was telling them, you're going to be entering a promised land. And in that promised land, people there were what? Worshipping many gods. They come out of a nation that believed in many gods. Now you're going to go into a land and territory where worship what? Many gods. So what is the desert? The purpose for being in the desert. We don't like it, but there was a purpose. He's isolating us, calling us a people, a new nation, under God, the only God, so that when we go into that place, we not have to fall in trap to those many God issues. And sometimes we have habits and stuff that we have hold on to that we don't want to even face or deal with. But folks, you'll still be a slave if you don't understand what God wants to do when He gave us that commandment. There we go. Oh, so God, you got the Bible? Let's turn to chapter 6. I mean, chapter 6, verse 4. It says what? Whose translation? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your right. I mean, might. Yeah, number 6 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be what? Upon your what? Heart. heart. What does that mean? He says, I want you to put these commandments in your heart. What does that mean? What do you really put in your heart? What do you put in your heart? What you hold dear. What's most important. It's like when you fall in love, it's by your heart, right? It's everything, your heart. Valentine's Day, your heart. You know, they use the concept today, but it comes down to that. What's dear to you? what you treasure the most. So he says, hold on to this commandment. Hold on to it because you're going to need it. You're going to need to understand it. You're going to need to hold on to it because rituals don't do it for you. Verse 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Then number verse 7, what did it say verse 7? You shall teach them diligently to your children. That's right. Louder. How do you teach it to your children diligently? Now this is a concept because in Proverbs it teaches the same thing. To train your child in the way it should go. So often we say, I tell my kids this. I take them to church. The key here is to be the example to your kids. Because if you're not an example, you can talk to them all you want. But it won't mean nothing in the end. These commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts. And they said, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you what? Sit at home. And when you walk along the road. When you lie down. And when you get up. And then number eight. What does he say to do? You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. What does that mean? What do you do with that one commandment? What is he telling you to do with it? So he's giving you specific. You want your family, everything to work out? Hold on to that first commandment. Then you won't even have to worry about the suffering. Because suffering is a part of growth. But when you have this in your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, it doesn't matter whether the roof is coming down, whether the sea is coming over you, you are 
secure. Because that commandment is saying, do you have a relationship with that one true God? There was only three people that had it at that time, and maybe four. I will give Aaron, who were the other three I'm talking about. Who was number one coming out of Egypt? Who was the leader? Who was the one, his right-hand man? Joshua. Joshua. Uh, but his brother Aaron was the one that was there that got sent to first with him. Then it was Joshua, and who was the last one? Caleb. 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 Think about what Caleb did, especially after they conquered the promised land, because he did something far beyond what none of the other ones did. And why was he able to do so much more? Now these are stories that you need to sort of read in the Bible. But God gave you the commandments for a reason. And so often we just go on and ritual and walk in. Now, he's teaching us how important it is to have the faith, the, the relationship with God, we call it. Not so much a religion, but the relationship. The relationship ultimately comes down to a personal, something personal, something you, you take dear, you take serious. So he's saying it, it goes even deeper. Because think about it, when I try to make uh, Netflix, my God, the only thing it did for me was entertain me and distracted me or kept me occupied while I waited. That's the only thing. Exposing me to all the junk that it has. I always use moves and stuff to learn. I always use that as an excuse. But what does God give you? Think about what God gives you when you put him first. I mean, I can list you a bunch of things. He provides me patience, love, kind, kindness, forgiveness. He gives me security, gives me strength. He gives me grace. I mean, he can fill in at any point in time. What else does he give you? Peace. Peace. What else did God give you? Joy, patience. What else? Perseverance. Perseverance. Provision. Provision. Oh. Say it loud. The desires of your heart. The desires of your heart. Protection. Victory. Come on, come on, there's so much more that God gives you. Satisfaction, sanctuary. Think about all the things that God gives you when you put him first. Success, vitality, healing, deliverance, happiness. happiness. He gives you all that where only one of those other gods not giving you anything that's going to produce any good fruit. But we do worship them. See, God is a God of creation, of all creation. He has, He designed you specifically. So when He gave you the Ten Commandments, the law, He has something intended for you. Something that you were meant to accomplish in this world that no one else can. But we limit ourselves because we are, okay, growing to the lie and security. I went way off target, but here it is. Because I'm not going to go into all the other commandments today. Today's commandment is only dealing with which one? Have no what? Matthew 22, verse 37. Somebody turn to that because you're going to read it right now. Most of us love our family, but most of us struggle being around them, right? You know how hard that is, right? So as we learn about the Ten Commandments, as we're going to be learning about what it means to be a half family and have a godly family, we're going to learn the effects. Because, you know, family has an effect on us. We also uh, have an effect on them. But so often, we are so stuck in our flesh, in our old dysfunction, that we cannot produce the fruit. Having a strong family will benefit us mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, folks. Remember, the Lord is one. Keep that in mind. Thousands of years ago, God gave the Ten Commandments to us. He said, this is how, you know, I was often that I hear people say, uh, you know, God didn't give us instructions to, to raise our kids. God gave you instruction. What did he give you? He gave you the Ten Commandments. He gave you exactly what you need. But we don't see it that way. How can we not see it? Well, he didn't give me instructions on when I got married how to do it. He gave you that. He gave you the word of God. He gave you everything you need right there in that Ten Commandments. The answer and solution to all your problems. You have a problem in school? The Ten Commandments. You have a problem at work? The Ten Commandments. 
You have, whatever it is, God has given it to you. And so often we can't see it. It says if you ignore the law of gravity, it's not going to be good. If you ignore God's commandments, it's not going to be good. And he's given us these things. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, let's look at uh, chapter 6, verse 10. He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your forefathers, right, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing classes with all the good things you have. Then he says, when it's going to be described all the way down, you know, in verse 12, he says, he, he says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord you brought, uh, the Lord brought you out, out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 13. Who has verse 13? One of those kids going to get verse 13. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oath in his name. He said, do not follow all the gods, the gods of the people around you, for the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you. And he will destroy you from the face of the land. He said, do not test the Lord your God. Do not test him. So often we just forget and we want to jump out of the window. He said, if you are going to break God's laws, realize that they are going to break you. Likewise, they are spiritual laws we should not ignore. Put God first. Turn to someone and say, put God first. God says, I demand top priority in your life. I'm not going to play second fiddle to anything. And I keep emphasizing this point. He deserves to be number one because he made you. Everything you have in life is from God. What does he mean to have no other God before me? Right? What is he saying? What is God? The God is anything that dominates your life. Anything that controls your life. People make careers, they're God. People make relationships, they're God. We've said that already. Everything God gives, give, uh, everything, every time God gives a principle, He also gives a promise. So whenever you see God's making a principle here, He's giving you a promise as well. Now, what, what is the promise? And, and there are plenty of promises what He'll give you if you follow him and you understand. Now he's telling everyone here to say, uh, love the Lord your God. You see, when he says, uh, that's his command, his decree, his law. And he tells you, you teach him to everyone else. And, and you are crossing the line and say, you will prosper. You will prosper. You will be blessed beyond measure. But so often we worship other God thinking that they're going to give us the things we need. We put more time in the stuff that we think that this God, the money God, is going to give me this. No, only God can give you the things that's going to produce good fruit. That money can enslave you. You become a slave to those gods. They look good. They have all those solutions. They got the formulas. They all look great, wonderful. But no, they'll enslave you. Put your trust in God, folks. The promise in everything you do, put God first and he will direct and crown your efforts with success. That's his promise. He gives you a promise. He said, do not want to be successful. He said, do you want to be successful? Put God first. Whenever you want God to bless you, put him first in every area. We're still trying to make things on our own. If you want to be strong, family, put God first. If you want to be strong marriage, put him first. But how do we do this? Ah, here's the key. How do we do this? Are you ready for how do we do it? Yeah. All right, because I'm going to give it to you. I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to finish it all, but here, I'm going to give it to you either way. All right? We're going to start. Because at this point, we want you to understand that when God, is, God put it in perspective for us when he, when he gave it to us. Now, they are, they're going to be a component. You say first, we're going to follow first. F, spell it. F-I-R-S-T. Right, first. All right, you put them first in your finances. Proverbs 3, 9, 10. Honor the Lord by giving him first part of all your income. He will fill your bonds overflow. But the God of mammon 
is going to tell you, hold on to it. Greed. Told you, this, is, you, this, is the way, this is the first thing you need to do. God's always going to produce those things. People have a way of finding excuses not to do it. They probably won't even come to church and say, if I don't come to church, I don't have to tie this week. Uh, I don't go two weeks, I save another. Time. I, mean, I don't go three weeks, I can save another three weeks. You're robbing yourself. But people want to believe that. God says, give me first. The first part of everything. Money is not a number. It's the number one test of your priority. It is the number one test of your priority. We don't, we don't, we don't see it, but, you know, that's, that's a principle. Deuteronomy 14, 23 tells you there as well. The purpose of tithing, it teaches you that. Why does tithing? God says the first 10% of all you make goes back to Him. The purpose is simple, to teach you to put God first. That is it. It is the principle. And when the principle comes a what? Promise. God, you're not keeping up. Where the principle comes up? Promise. And what's the promise in that principle? He will multiply what? A hundred times. We go to the second one. Right? Put God first in your eyes. Interest. What's an interest? What's an interest? What you interested in? Sneakers. Sneakers. <laughs> in your interests. Right? Putting God first in your interest means in my fun time, in my play time, my amusement, my recreation, my hobbies, in my pastime. How do you put Him first in your interest? Do it with an attitude of gratitude. You have to put it as an attitude of gratitude. What he's provided you with. An acknowledgement. Let me go to the next one. And anyway, one scripture for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. R. Put it first in your relationships if you want uh, God first in your life you're going to have to choose your friends carefully folks so often we don't we don't take too much uh, time to consider that Proverbs chapter 27 verse 19 what a man is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses Proverbs 27, 19. What does a friend have to do with God being first in your life? Think about that. What does God have to do with you choosing friends in your life? They can do that so easily. Anybody else? That's right. In the same way that you are what you eat, right? You know, that's those these are these are concepts that are there. Who do you invite to your home? What kind of strong values do they have? That's why when God says, listen, when you go to the promised land, you need to clean it out. Don't associate with these guys because they're going, that was their downfall. They went there and started to, you know, just do what they did to fit in. They didn't have to go there to fit in. They were supposed to understand that they were the, what were they? Standard. The standard. But they compromised. Proverbs 20, 12, 26. A righteous man, a woman, is careful about his or her friendships. And you don't provide models for them to uh, get at this group of our peers and then get it from TV. If you don't teach your kids what it is to have this kind of model, then they're going to get it from somewhere else. S, 
The S says that, but first, the S means schedule. That's right, schedule. Put God first in your schedule, in your time. Make the most of your time. Grasp firmly what you know to be the will of God. If you find yourself having more things to do than you have time to do, it means you're doing some things that are in God's will. God never puts more on you. Remember what he says in that scripture? He never puts more on you than you can put in your, uh, that you have to bear. That structure, discipline. And here we go, we're going to go to the last one. And did I give you a scripture verse on that one? I don't know. get back to the scripture verse again. T. T. You ready? Put them first in your troubles. How do you put them in your troubles? Why do you turn? Who do you turn to when you're faced with unexpected problems and pressures? When you have a crisis? You try to solve it yourself? You try to go to your Lord and best friend? I mean, yes, we go to a team, a prayer team and pray, but you first got to go to who? God. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 50, 15. Call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will be, and you will honor me. Let me say that again. Call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will you will honor me. And so often we try to fix the problems and it all fails. God says, turn to me first. Many people tie situations run into everybody else before they stop and pray to God. When God is first in any of these five areas, we begin to worry. Uh, when God is not first, we begin to worry. Now, you know what the damage is for worry? Now, I'm not going to attempt to get into the part of worry because worry is, is a big problem in, in society and in our lives because it affects us in a lot of these areas I'm going to be giving you the next time we come together. It affects us and is damaging. Matthew 6.25, hold on to that scripture so you know. Also, Matthew 6.32 says, Seek the kingdom of God and put him first in everything and then he gives you the promise. And he says, in all the things shall be added to you. But in 625, he says, the ill effects of worry. Jesus tells us not to worry about those needs. That God promises to supply. See, but when we worry, it damages our health. It causes us, it causes us to, uh, the object of your worry to consume your thoughts. It disrupts productivity. It negatively affects the way you treat others. And five, it reduces your ability to trust in God. There's a difference between worry and genuine concern, folks. Worry immobilizes, concerns, moves you to into action. Don't get your body heads.